Thank you. Hello, thank you for coming or watching. Um, my name is Brittany and I'll be presenting uh, my study which centered on four historic African-American cemeteries in Jacksonville, Florida. Before I get started, I just wanna thank my community members and everyone who participated in this project and um, to the more senior anthropologists and archeologists who helped me along the way. Uh, this project wouldn't have been possible without all of you. Thank you. And without further ado, let's get into it. So this project began back in 2013 um, while I was presenting a paper on Barbados at the 98th Annual Association for the Study of African-American Life and History Conference in my hometown, Jacksonville, Florida. During the panel discussion, one community member stood up and said, why aren't you studying Jacksonville? <laughs> this question was a pointed reminder that Jacksonville's African-American history uh, is rich and largely unexplored by anthropologists, particularly the city's post-emancipation history. In fact, for the last 50 years, most of the city's African diaspora archaeology centered on Kingsley Plantation. Kingsley Plantation is the oldest known burial place for Africans in Jacksonville. It's named for the Kingsley occupation period, uh, which, spanned from four, which spanned from 1814 to 1834. The plantation was owned and operated by Zephaniah Kingsley and his Senegalese wife, Anna, who held roughly 60 captives. Not only is Kingsley Plantation the birth of my career in African American archaeology, it is also the birthplace of the field African uh, American archaeology. Excavation began there in 1968, and it was led by a University of Florida archaeologist named Charles Fairbanks. Today, the site is a national park. Bill. My hometown has a wealth of post-emancipation African-American history and culture. Despite the failures of reconstruction and the implementation of Jim Crow, Jacksonville gave birth to a bustling African-American majority town filled with doctors, politicians, lawyers, business people, and the state's first black millionaire. And this is the state's first black millionaire here on the left. Self-sufficiency, uh, entrepreneurship, and education were the hallmarks of Jacksonville's African-American community, and their social and economic achievements were acknowledged across the nation. And uh, featured here is Eartha and uh, Clara, her mother. So this is Clara, and this, this is Eartha and M. White, who were famous uh, businesswomen and uh, staunch uh, philanthropists and very uh, well known for their uh, philanthropic endeavors in Jacksonville, Florida. So much so uh, that this community was noted by famed scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote, how far is the Negro American today economically able to maintain a system of charitable relief for his own people? We can perhaps best realize these conditions by picturing a single community, Jacksonville, Florida. However, much of what African-Americans built after slavery and during the 20th century um, has since been destroyed by the city's urban renewal projects. I decided to explore uh, this history through the material culture of the community's early 20th century African-American cemeteries, Memorial, Sunset Memorial, Pinehurst, and Mount Olive, all located near the intersecting roads um, of Moncrief and 45th Street on the north side of Jacksonville, Florida. Collectively, these cemeteries contain an estimated 70,000 marked and unmarked African-American burials. And nearly after a century after their creation, these municipal cemeteries have come under heavy scrutiny uh, by the local government officials and media outlets, as well as some residents, and are frequently noted as abandoned and neglected spaces. But today I wanna to focus a little bit on the methodology um, and how I was able to center uh, the descendant community's voices in this project. So 
This theory, this, this theory and methodology was heavily influenced by the African uh, Burial Ground Project in New York. And this research was conducted under the guidance of biocultural anthropologist, Dr. Michael Blakey. And it explicitly draws on the African Burial Ground Project in New York. My research also draws on black and native womanist archeologists and anthropologists such as Zora Neale Hurston, Janetta B. Cole, and Ashley Atkins Spivey. This, this study articulates its findings using terms and ideas set forth by Toni Morrison and Salamisha Tillett. Morrison and Tillett provide a vocabulary that is explicitly consistent with the social and political experiences of African-Americans living in Jacksonville, Florida. My research began by consulting the community. Descendant communities have always played essential roles in anthropology and archeology span projects. It is often local people, the descendant community, whose family and oral histories we rely on. They are often ones who uh, are the ones to uncover uh, sites, provide translations, and uh, provide cultural competency for community outsiders who wanna study them. This project's descendant community included friends, family members, associates, future colleagues, um, and community leaders and elders. The method I employed uh, was, is a specific type of client-based method that's fashioned after the African Burial Ground Project. I held community meetings, I visited homes, I went to schools, I went to libraries, I went to local museums, uh, historical societies, genealogy societies, I went to cookouts and fish fries and funeral homes and churches. There, I met African-American men and women of various ages who had connections with these cemeteries. I expressed my research interest in post-emancipation cemeteries and I asked each of them what they wanted out of this project. Although some residents were interested in the, in the site's material culture, um, an overwhelming majority of the residents that I was working with had other ideas about what lines of inquiry should be prioritized in this study. Their demands were as follows. Find out who's buried in the cemeteries, and by this they mean um, highlighting the African Americans after slavery who really built Jacksonville and shaped our um, city socially, culturally, and politically. Um, address the racist treatment of African Americans in the city, which include, which for them included uh, disparities between maintaining Euro American cemeteries and African American cemeteries, and address the preservation and maintenance issues. And then I had one last special request to take the community members um, to the captive African cemetery at Kingsley Plantation. Earlier archeologists who had done work on Kingsley Plantation um, ended up uncovering um, a captive African site. The site was not disclosed to the community and the community was not made aware of any excavations or work being done on the captive African cemetery. And they wanted to go uh, see the site and commemorate it. So I took my proposal and this list back to my committee and I reworked my dissertation proposal. And when I returned to Jacksonville that summer, I led a group of community members out to Kingsley Plantation's Captive African Cemetery to perform a libation ceremony to commemorate the dead. This idea that scholars have a duty to respond to the issues that impact their communities has long existed among Black intellectuals. From the late 19th century writings of Haitian anthropologist Antonin Vermin uh, to the more recent inter inter intellectual interventions uh, from scholars like Michelle Alexander and Kimberly Crenshaw. My goal was to create a project that foregrounded the descendant community's voices and operated from an African diaspora frame of reference. Um, to do this, uh, achieving this would require an interdisciplinary approach to my research, uh, which spanned archaeology, archival research, um, genealogy, architecture, art, and oral history. It also meant that my community would be actively involved in this project from start to finish, and their perspectives would guide my research and my interpretation of these sites. Additionally, they would always have access 
to this project and this research. Addressing the community's needs. So interpreting this site um, inherently included uh, me addressing uh, the concerns of my community and their list of demands. So the first thing was to address who was buried in the cemetery. In addition to searching the archives, I worked with the Southern Genealogist Exchange Society of Jacksonville. Um, and my point of contacts were Mike Lawson and John Ferguson. Uh, the Ritz, I worked with the Ritz Theater and Museum of Jacksonville, which is a local African-American history museum. And I also worked with the historic preservation section of the city of Jacksonville's planning and development department to locate the uh, family plots and individuals within these cemeteries and to also tell their stories. I did this by creating uh, family histories and short biographies of folks that were buried in these cemeteries. Family histories and individual biographies helped to connect the past to the present and situate the family's histories within broader historical narratives. Some of the highlights of my findings included discovering uh, J.W.C. Pennington's grave in Old City Cemetery. Um, J.W.C. Uh, Pennington was an active abolitionist in New York. Um, he was also a famed clergyman in Jacksonville, and he was also Yale's first Black student. Another highlight included um, discovering William Bartley, a uh, former Tuskegee Airmen's grave, who was unmarked. I was able to uh, use records to help locate the location of his grave so that his uh, family could place a stone. So those were some of the highlights. Okay. So the material culture, in many ways, uh, this study provides opposing evidence to the idea that these cemeteries have been abandoned and neglected by their respective African-American community. The archeological record actually shows that not only are African-American residents continuing to bury their dead within these spaces in the 21st century, but they've also carried on uh, performing African-American funerary customs. Within archeology, span African-American burial practices have come to be associated with things uh, including, but not limited to, the color white, um, shells, reflective objects, pipes, uh, wa water and objects that represent water and items last touched by the dead. Shells, mounded graves, uh, medicine bottles and bed frames dating from the 20th century to the 21st century are just some of the types of material assemblages that can be found within the cemeteries on Moncrief today. And this is a picture uh, from Sunset Memorial. Uh, many of these objects you'll notice, uh, especially in this picture, are European manufactured, yet at the same time, uh, these objects are also embedded in African cultural traditions. The use of mass produced items as grave goods in Jacksonville and in the diaspora more, more broadly highlights the multivalent ways in which African Americans uh, utilized and made meaning from the material culture that was available to them. In other words, they're taking mass produced items and they're using it in very um, African and African American ways. However, there's, an, there's another issue. Many of the graves look like this. And what you'll notice is a lot of these graves don't have material culture. And there's, there's a plethora of reasons for that, including cemetery cleanups that aren't informed by African American heritage and culture. Um, so a lot of what is placed on graves is also interpreted as trash. It is not. Um, oftentimes they are commemorative uh, assemblages but they're cleared away uh, regardless. So we end up having a cemetery look like this. Um, so many of these graves do not have visible artifacts and an overwhelming absence of grave goods in historic African-American cemeteries like those on Moncrief prompts archeologists to think more critically about the ways in which the physical state of these cemeteries intersects with the social history of the city's African-American community. Secondly, it prompts practitioners to look beyond material expressions of commemoration in the cemeteries when exploring contemporary commemorative practices among African-Americans. 
Okay. So let's talk a little bit about commemoration in the 21st century. Interviews with residents revealed that 21st century African-American commemorative practices often involve transit material culture, including photo albums, t-shirts, necklaces, and other uh, forms of objects and memorabilia. One resident stated that around the 70s and 80s, it was different. We, as in African-Americans, uh, became transit and the cemetery is a fixed landscape. And so we have trouble getting people to visit. Now, people don't go to the cemetery. Similarly, another one stated that you might not be able to go to the cemetery. You can't go to the cemetery every day. So on the days uh, you wake up and that person is on your mind, you grab your memory. In other words, as the African-American community of Jacksonville became more transit, so did their material culture as it relates to commemorative, commemoration. So the absence of grave goods in the fixed landscape of the cemetery does not connote the absence of commemoration among African-Americans. And this is a uh, final report from the Blue Ribbon Commission that was established to investigate uh, abandoned and quote neglected cemeteries. And this is the quote that they have featured prominently uh, by uh, Gladstone, William Gladstone. Um, and so this particular quote, uh, and this is from the city of Jacksonville, draws a connection between the civic capacity of the respective African-American community and the state of their cemeteries. But I found one issue with that in my archival research. My archival research revealed that these cemeteries were municipal, which means that the local government had taken responsibility for their perpetual care. I also discovered in my archival research that the, that the city had established a cemetery trust fund for the site's perpetual care. However, um, collectively, these sites displayed very little evidence of adequate perpetual care. And this is a picture from one of the graves in Pinehurst. Um, it is a vaulted grave and you can see that um, water has built up in it. Uh, there's a, there is a body in there, uh, but it's filled with water. Um, so the perpetual care and there's loads of um, knocked over headstones and various other issues with the preservation of the site, including graves migrating uh, due to rainwater. Um, so various participants in this study have strongly suggested that the perpetual care of these historic sites is the responsibility of the local, state, and or federal government, and I'm inclined to agree with them. Uh, one participant asserted that the lack of maintenance provided by the city actually demonstrates the city's lack of commitment to preserving these cemeteries. Another asserted that the site's perpetual care should actually be federally funded. For many participants in this study, these sites and the maintenance of these sites is deeply intertwined with discriminatory practices and ongoing systemic racism within the community. The recent publicity given uh, to the untimely deaths of African American women, men, and children in the civil rights in the post civil rights era has refocused American consciousness on the legacy of civic estrangement inherited by African Americans living in the United States today. The frequency and circumstances in which Black death often occurs illustrates the ongoing status of African-Americans as categorical non-citizens and the ways in which that has been reinvented during reconstruction, civil rights, and in the post-civil rights era. Today, African-Americans on the north side of Jacksonville are continuing to experience many of the same disadvantages now as they did in the early 20th century. One participant noted that Jacksonville was quote, still a divided racist city. The appearance may have changed, but the practices and attitudes haven't. African-American children have been especially susceptible to sudden, violent, and senseless death, often falling victim to poor prenatal care, malnutrition, infection, disease, and violence. 
the prevalence of excess death among African-Americans in Jacksonville, particularly the city's youth, in addition to the community's economic disenfranchisement over the last century, has come to shape the community's cultural practices and reconfigure the ways in which they memorialize and commemorate death. The treatment of black life from slavery to the post-civil rights era has not only repeatedly called into question African-American citizenship, it has also transformed historic African-American cemeteries into what Toni Morrison calls cultural sites of memory. Historic African-American cemeteries like Memorial, Sunset Memorial, Pinehurst and Mount Olive in and of themselves are sites of memory. They are tangible reminders of the past that continue to inform the community's present. The emphatic resurgence of the imagery of young African-American people being brutalized and killed in the 21st century is in tandem with and contextualized by the legacy of slavery and the Jim Crow era. For African-Americans living in Jacksonville today, the deaths of Addie Mae Collins, Carol Robinson, Cynthia Wesley, Denise McNair, and Emmett Till are in concert with the 21st century slayings of Breonna Taylor, Tanisha Anderson, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Charlena Lyles, Atatiana Jefferson, and Jordan Davis. And Jordan Davis is a Jacksonville native um, who was murdered in Jacksonville November 23rd, 2012. The historic African-American cemeteries that have collected these black bodies serve as both memorials to those who have passed on and as the tangible evidence of the community's suffering. For participants, the discriminatory practices between um, allocating funds to preserve these sites um, represents the same kind of racism that African-Americans uh, face in life it extends on into their death. They have specifically pointed to the city's allocation of resources for the upkeep of these spaces and the excess number of Black and African-American bodies that filled them. So on behalf of my community, I contacted the local city officials to inquire about that cemetery fund and to ask about sustainable funding for the perpetual care of these spaces. And on July 23rd, 2018, as this project drew, drew near completion, the city announced that it would dedicate $10.8 million to the perpetual care of these spaces. Thank you. And if it's okay, I think I will stop sharing my screen now. Is that okay? We can also leave it up if you like, if you need to flip back to something. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for the beautiful and wonderful presentation. Um, we're just gonna uh, let people know that we are accepting questions now. So if you need to take a minute to type something out, please do use the, the Q and A function um, and ask away. I guess maybe while people are thinking and formulating their questions, maybe I can ask something. Um, I'm kind of just blown away by the modern day impact that your research has had, um, your archeological and anthropological research has had um, to the modern day communities of the people that you're working with. Um, and I was wondering, do you have any plans to sort of revisit or to do another similar project or any advice you may have um, to someone who's doing similar historical archeology span about how they might go about pursuing this type of research? I know this is I threw three questions at you and they're so broad, <laughs> but take any part or one or two or. Um, yeah, so I'm actually looking forward to, well, post pandemic, I'm actually looking forward to going back to Jacksonville uh, to gather more information and expand in certain areas. For example, uh, the material culture that's observed in the cemetery, I'd like to expand on some of the origins of those cultural practices um, and also 
do kind of an update on, uh, expand on what the city has done since I left Jacksonville in 2019 um, and this dissertation came to a close, what they've done to preserve the site since. I'm very interested in that. Um, and hopefully a publication will come out of this particular research. Um, I also wanna expand a little bit more on the lives, particularly the black women um, who built, helped to build and shape uh, Jacksonville to what it is today. Um, the African-American community had a lot of economic power um, and there were plenty of business women there who used their resources to financially support the community. They built shelters, um, they provided housing, uh, when Jacksonville had a fire, uh, when the Great Depression happened, uh, those women particularly, and also men came together, those business people, that community came together and they, they provided their own relief for their community. Um, so I'm very interested in kind of teasing out the more nuanced aspects of those stories. And that's something that I felt like I didn't get to do in the dissertation that I really wanna do um, now. So I am actually returning to this research right now. Um, so hope that answers your question. <laughs> it did. Thank you so much. And we have quite a few in the Q&A. Um, so I'm just going to go through uh, and just start reading them to you. So we have a, a question from Julia Buena Strong, and she asks, what was your experience in working on this project and the emotions that it elicited as uh, you worked or I don't I'm not sure if you excavated the question asked if you as you dug up the past that had been purposely lost and forgotten. Okay, so I feel like, let me address the first part of that. I bit, I actually didn't dig the site. Um, the community made that decision and the community totally has the right to make that decision, whether there's something that they feel like they need um, answers to that can be found in the ground or not. For this case, uh, because this burial ground is being perpetually used by this community, um, they didn't want that um, because it's too close generationally to the community. Um, it's something that they go to and if people have their like aunts, uncles, cousins, children in there and they didn't want that. Um, and it also wasn't necessary um, for me to address some of what the community wanted to have addressed. I mean, I was able to do some of the material culture. And for that last part, so <laughs> it's funny, not to make it about me, <laughs> but my mother has maternal uh, she has a maternal ancestors that were present during the time period that I was looking at, who were present in Jacksonville. And we actually ended up at, through, because I was in the archives and I was doing genealogy, figured out that one of the uh, wealthy businessmen who were operating in Jacksonville had actually married into my mother's family. And so they have a plot in one of these older cemeteries as well. So um, that was great for her. She loved that history. Um, and so it, it became very sort of personal for me because I don't think of myself as someone who doesn't care about cemeteries. I feel like I've dedicated my whole life to cemeteries. Um, yet, you know, my ancestors are, you know, in these cemeteries that are quote unquote dilapidated and neglected. Um, and I just didn't know about them because the community was so transit. My people moved around a lot. And I think that's what happened to a lot of uh, families living in Jacksonville. We were so transit that people lose their connection to the fixed space and tend to uh, remain attached to the people and the memories and the ancestral uh, memory of the people in the spaces, but not the particular cemetery. So it was very personal and emotional <laughs> on a lot of levels, especially the libation ceremony at Kingsley Plantation. That was really, yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, from Joyce Marcus. Uh, she asked, did you create a registry and genealogy of all these people in the cemeteries, uh, a giant database perhaps? So I didn't create a database. Um, even though I was considering it, it was just a lot to do, I think, in a dissertation. And that's something that I can think about moving forward. But, um, and this is why I say like, going into the community and talking to people is, is a very important part because you don't know what parts of the will you might be rein, reinventing. You don't need to reinvent it, right? Like the genealogy society and the historical societies in Jacksonville um, did a, actually a lot of work already as far as um, mapping out where people's graves are and recording it. So it's not in a formal searchable database and that can be kind of the next step. Like I can take those records and make it digital uh, so that people can search it. And that would be something to consider 
like moving forward. It's, it wasn't something I was sort of thinking about as a graduate student. Um, but there is, to answer the question, there is there are files which I did add to during my uh, during my research. There were graves that I uncovered and was able to add to that database, um, but it's not like digitized or anything yet. And it is housed at the uh, Southern Genealogy Society. And there was two men, uh, Mike Lawson and John Ferguson, who did tremendous work um, recording the African-American cemeteries. But there's also things that they weren't able to get to. Just people didn't, um, you know, the connections, the rapport is different. So there was cemeteries and spaces they weren't able to access that I could. Wonderful. That sounds like a wonderful collaborative project down the road with your own students. So that's going to be exciting to see, maybe. Um, we have another question from uh, Michael Lydie, and he asks, are mound burials covered with concrete, uh, concrete functional in some sense, or are they symbolic? I have seen very similar grave types in Ann Arbor some AA cemeteries. I, I read Ann Arbor, I'm sorry, in AA cemeteries in Mississippi. Um, mounded graves are really and more of an aesthetic, I think, than a function. Um, and you do, you see them in African, uh, historic African-American cemeteries all over the country, South Carolina, Alabama, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, wherever you go, um, there's, there tends to be a mound shape. Um, so I would say it's more cultural. So it's a more of a, an African aesthetic uh, to the burial space which makes sense when, you, when we think about like African-American cemeteries, they're drawing on these ancestral cultural knowledges that, they're bring, that their ancestors have brought um, across the Atlantic with them. And that's what they're using to create these spaces. We have quite a few more questions. <laughs> Do you need a, a <laughs> moment to breathe? There's 16, so hopefully we can get through <laughs> them. Um, so the next question uh, is from Cassidy Rayburn. She says, hello, beautiful presentation. I am currently working on a restoration project of the Brush Arbor Cemetery in Starkville, Mississippi, an African-American cemetery that is similar to the cemeteries you have talked about today. What are some of the ways that the community memorialized unmarked graves throughout the cemeteries? Um, so unmarked graves, I would say people would go and place things on them, uh, typically like shells or items that would represent their loved ones. Um, I've also seen people, particularly in Jacksonville, use plants, yucca to be specific, yucca plant. Uh, they will use yucca plant to mark uh, graves that don't have headstones. Um, and they'll sort of kind of use the landscape to you know, mark, mark the space. I've also seen uh, people tie things to like trees and things, again, using the landscape to mark the space, but instead of placing something on the grave, maybe have it tied to a tree near the grave. Um, so those are some of the things that I've seen. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have uh, another question from Jordan Dalton. She asks, outside of the cemeteries, are there been very many other historic sites that preserve the rich history of Jacksonville and the multifaceted lives of the previous residents? Um, outside of the cemeteries, there are a couple plaques throughout Jacksonville, but I think Jacksonville is really a gold mine when it comes to um, marking spaces and building commemorative uh, things around that particular history, particularly African-American history, a lot of it is buried. Um, a, it, a lot of it is not talked about. And um, the folks in Jacksonville who sh really shaped Jacksonville directly after slavery, it used to be a black majority town. Um, a lot of that has been covered up on purpose. Um, when they seized political power from the black community, that power was never really regained. And so a lot of the tearing down of their buildings and the covering up of that history, um, in a lot of ways has been intentional throughout the decades. Um, and what comes to mind is the neighborhood of Sugar Hill, which was all these wealthy black people um, who were living in these extravagant mansions and they were doctors, they were lawyers, um, James Walding Johnson was a part of this community, right? They had famous friends, W.E.B. Du Bois knew these people well. Um, they built a highway straight through that, that, uh, that neighborhood. They tore it down, uh, they built a hospital over it. Very few people know that Sugar Hill existed. Um, 
there's one there's one single standing house left and you know it used to be a black majority town so there's plenty of places there's plenty of black history there a uh, two spot nightclub which was on the north side who had famous african american performers coming from all over the country very few people know that that nightclub existed um so there's all of these pockets around the city that could be um memorialized and held up as part of the history but there's but there are very few um but what i will say is the american beach museum uh, which is a which was the only beach that people could go to that, of color, which was purchased by a very wealthy African American family. Florida, Florida's first Black millionaire, A. L. Lewis, purchased that tract of land. The Afro Life Insurance Company purchased that for Black people to go. They have a museum, and they have a lot of history preserved in there. And then also the Ritz uh, Theater Museum has a lot of the African, the local history there as well. So I will say that. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. So we're switching uh, gears and questions just a little. I have a question here from Kendrick McCabe. Uh, they say, hello, I really like the addition to taking ethnological and archaeological approach. I do find typically that with grad students coming up with their projects, it is not necessarily the concerns of the community or what they can do for the community. It is more looking at the project from a semi, how useful is this to my goals slash dissertation, dissertation and what can we learn from the university? Did you do pre-work to see if the community had an interest in your research? How much did your project change once the community had requests of you and your research? What a wonderful question, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, so uh, my project began in 2013, but that was really the preliminary. I didn't start working on it until 2015. So all of that was me meeting with community members for two years. I met with community members going back and forth, uh, negotiating with my committee, what they would want to see or required of me um, and what my community required of me. Luckily, I had a dissertation advisor, uh, Dr. Michael Blakey, who was very community uh, centered in his research, actually the Senate community, um, the term and the use of it in the field of archeology span and anthropology was first applied to his project, the African Burial Grounds. So I got a lot of leeway. <laughs> I got a lot of leeway when it came to serving uh, my community. Um, and they completely actually overhauled, I had a whole different, I had a whole different dissertation <laughs> proposal when I brought it to them. And then when I brought it to them and asked them what they wanted to see out the project, uh, the project became their needs and their, their interests. Um, and I had a section, the material culture, that's what I was interested in. I was like material culture, um, but they had all of these other things that they wanted to see in my research. And that ended up being the bulk of my research. And so when I go back and do uh, expanding on that, I'll expand on what I've already done, but also the material culture because most of it um, has been the community's needs and interests. And I actually think um, the institution, uh, which mine was William and Mary at the time, but I think this is applicable to any museums and any institutions. When you allow your graduate students to go out into the field and serve communities, you're instantly positioning your institution as an agent of change and you're making your institution a resource for that community. And I think that's kind of the future of our discipline. I think that's the future of anthropology. I think that's how archaeology stays relevant. Um, why would we care about archaeology and anthropology in the 21st century? Uh, because we're cultural resources. We're agents of change um, and we're resources for the community's needs and interests. And I really do think that's the, the future of our discipline. So allow, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid to. So a short answer, yes, it, my whole entire project changed. Uh, but I wasn't afraid of that. I embraced that. And it's fine. I didn't want it was fine. I'm proud of what I've done. I wanted it to be like a self portrait. I, I wanted to write something the community could see themselves in. So That was so wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for that uh, wonderful answer. And I very much agree with you. I do, I do think and hope that this is the future of our discipline. Uh, we have another question uh, from Michelangelo Giampaoli. And they ask, what kind of concrete actions can be done in your opinion to connect the growing academic study and enhancement of cemeteries with the local populations, especially with teenagers and young adults who may be less familiar with cemeteries? I think, um, I think programming 
is very important. Community-based programming, um, going into communities and getting, kids like to get their hands dirty. They do, they do. And um, we might think of like cleaning cemetery stone, like the headstones, at, that process was, is very, very cool. So teaching people about the culture and the history and then allowing the people to reclaim the space and go into those spaces and, and care for them and use them and be educated about the culture and the history. Um, if you ask the average person to identify some aspects of African-American distinctly, or what they, what they feel like was distinctly African-American culture, um, I don't think you'd get a lot of answers. And so I think just there, right? That's an opportunity for learning and engagement. Um, also, this is where I think uh, the individual biographies and family histories come in. Um, being able to tease out those biographies, being able to tease out the specific people and their contributions to the city or community um, actually does draw people in. People are actually very interested um, especially Black people, they're actually interested in what people, what Black people made of their situation after slavery and what achievements they were able to make. Um, and I think the 20, in the 21st century, um, it's more visible than ever, right? Black history. Um, so I think that tying those individual family histories and, and biographies together with the actual programming, um, that's a negotiation between uh, what the sites need and what the community interests are and what they need. Um, and that can range anything from volunteer work to paid positions and college credit and all, all types of things uh, that people could do um, that would serve their interest as well as uh, bridge together what, what these sites may need. Just building off a little bit from that uh, on what the sites need specifically, um, Christina Tillery asks, in our localities, how can we help restore historic African-American cemeteries? Um, I think the best way to do that is to get linked up with, there's usually local um, archaeology, public archaeology networks and things like that, um, historic uh, preservation sections of your city. Uh, for us, that's FPAN, uh, Florida Public Archaeology Network, does a lot of work and the uh, historic preservation section of the city of Jacksonville. Each city has something similar to that that's dedicated uh, to preserving uh, historic sites in that city. So I would contact those people that are already out there doing those works in other sites and get with them and see what, what they can do. You, they typically come out to wink, wink. They're not called a lot. <laughs> Nobody's calling them like, their phones are not ringing off the hook a lot, I don't think. Um, but they're typically willing, willing to come out and train community members how to do this work um, and how to properly restore. And I think when you pair that with somebody who's culturally competent, i.e. someone who's not gonna look at a shell mound on an African-American grave and call it trash and say it needs to be thrown away, I think um, you're on the right track. So I would start there. I would start with your local archeology span uh, networks and your historic preservation uh, whatever uh, your city has the, the equivalent to the historic uh, preservation in your city. I think those are great places to start. State archeologists too, you can contact them as well. Um, they're around. Wonderful. Um, we have quite a few more questions. Um, so the next one um, is from Elizabeth A. Sobel and she asks, did the city's decision to allocate 10.8 million involve or generate controversy or pushback from certain sectors of the local population? Um, not that I know of. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get that. I mean, other than the other than the whispering under their breath on the sidewalk, I I didn't, there were no like outright protests that these uh this money shouldn't go to this. And actually, I think I think the contribution might actually have grown since 2018. So um, I think it's officially like built in solidly to the budget and I, I haven't, I went through the, the voting on having that for the next budget and there weren't, it was unanimous. So I don't think so. Wonderful. Um, so we have another question from A. Smith and they say, hello, Dr. Brown, thank you for that wonderful presentation. While I was an undergrad, I was a student researcher working on a project centered on a historic African-American cemetery in Baltimore City that was demolished and replaced with a shopping center. 
So far, my former instructors, with the assistance of a local African American genealogy society, working to have a, are working to have a historical marker placed on the site and push legislation to protect African American cemeteries in Maryland. Oh, to protect African American cemeteries in Maryland. Sorry, how have have there been any efforts to do the same in Jacksonville? Um. There, I don't, there's not been formal le legislation uh, to protect African American cemeteries in Jacksonville. Um, uh, and a lot of that land, like when I was talking to my constituents and going through uh, the oral histories of the sites, that land had actually been encroached on. And it's quite common uh, for the city and commercial businesses to kind of take over a cemetery or portions of a cemetery and just build on it. And I don't think uh, there's any particular laws that say you can't do that right now. Um, for these sites, though, what I will say is these sites were established by and large by the Afro-American Life Insurance Company. And I will say this is a difference. Um, the sites I was working with, because they were established by this Afro-American Life Insurance Company, they sold plots as private properties. So uh, when those properties were abandoned, uh, nobody was checking <laughs> the encroachment or what was happening to the site once the uh, family who purchased that site had moved on. So there are all of these little, little uh, ways in which, but I will say we, just overall, African-American cemeteries don't receive the same legal protections as other sites as far as like the federal or state laws that protect them. So in short, no. <laughs> in short, no. We have another question from Elena Cooper. And uh, she says, hello, great presentation. There are multiple graves that have been found in Tampa, Florida. How did you get the community excited about your work and engaged? A woman told me the graves are so old and forgotten that it's gonna be hard to get the community engaged. Um, well, I, I will say this, not all of the people that I met at these churches and barbecues and fish fries, not all of them were interested in my project or in cemeteries in general. Um, cemeteries for a lot of people creeps them out. But what they were interested in is the biographies of the black people that were in the cemeteries. They were interested in the history and the culture, the cultural aspects. Um, so the things that they were doing um, in the cemeteries or that had been passed on to them, they were interested in knowing the history of those practices. They were interested in knowing about the history of the city and the contribution that black people had made to the city. So that was one point of entry. The other point of entry, as I was talking to younger people, um, allowing the establishment of the drawing, making the connections between what they were saying and the historical trajectory of their circumstances and the things that are going on around them, being able to help them connect that to a broader historical narrative of tracing it back to early 20th century and, and uh, the uh, right after emancipation, the death of dying, uh, the disproportional lack of home ownership that they're seeing, um, the lack of health care that they're seeing, uh, the, squat, uh, the curbed educational opportunities and the inferior school buildings that they see, um, helping them to connect that to a broader historical trajectory of how Black children and how Black people in Jacksonville specifically have, all, have been treated for a, a couple centuries now, um, I think made them excited in ways that they weren't beforehand because they could see the relevance of Black Lives Matter movement now to um, the Freedman's Bureau and the Colored uh, Relief Fund that the, their people in Jacksonville had established to help Black people better themselves. Um, so I think drawing in the history in personal ways, I think. And that, I think that might look different for each community, uh, different groups of people and, and, and you know, a 40 year old is not gonna be necessarily interested in the same thing or connect to the history in the same way as a 20 year old. So there has to be these various different points of entry, I think, um, and to make it personal. I always found the more personal uh, a person can, if you can make a project for a person, the more willing and excited and connected they will be because they are connected to these broad histories. It's a history of Jacksonville. It's a history of African-Americans in Jacksonville but it's their, also their family's history. This is their uncle, this is their cousin. These are things that affect their siblings. 
or their kids. Um, so the more personal connections uh, you can exude draws people in. We have six more questions. <laughs> do, do you think you can do it? Six more? Yeah, I can do it. I, okay, because I know I've just been throwing them at you. Okay, wonderful. So the next one is from Alana Cooper. Um, actually, no, we answered that one. I'm so sorry. Uh, the next one is from Kate. And she asks, what kind of social or economic factors seem to have led to the individual, um, to individuals not having grave markers? Okay, so there's, I think a couple. Um, so some people just couldn't afford grave markers. That's certainly one thing. Um, but then I think, uh, having the graves be, there's a lot of grave vandalism that goes on in these historic African-American cemeteries. One, because they're not, they're not policed or protected. Um, and when things happen naturally, like, you know, a headstone gets sunken in or knocked over. Um, they also use prison labor uh, to go into these cemeteries and they're not the most trained preservationists, the inmates. So if they knock something over, they'll just stack it somewhere else um, on the site. And so I think that's, but I think that's also tied into the economics of it, right? So instead of spending the money, we're gonna send inmates and do the labor for free, even though they might not be trained um, in cemetery preservation. I think that's also an economic factor. Um, so it's, I think it's more, it's more things like that than people not being able to uh, necessarily afford the headstones because um, back in the day, if people couldn't afford headstones, they would definitely make one. They would definitely create one. Wonderful. Um, we have another question from an anonymous attendee and they say, a fascinating and moving talk, thank you. Are there any particular practices involving the headstones or the engravings on them that are distinctive or significant in African-American culture? I think, I think once you get to mid 20th century, you start to see uh, headstones that are not unlike Euro-American cemeteries, right? Like it, it's like the whole mass produced objects thing. Like black people are also using forks, plates and spoons in the same way that they're using these uh, distinct types of headstones, right? That are respectable and dignified and these pillars and obelisks that are um, very much American, right? But I think it's the, handmade headstones that I think show a lot of the cultural distinctions, uh, the stuff that people will place, mirrors, um, shells, and the way that they, uh, the patterns that they make and the, the colors that they painted. Um, I think that more so, I saw a lot of that in the handmade headstones, but not like the mass produced ones. They're pretty, the mass produced ones are pretty generic and you know, if you go through the typology of, of headstones, you can see and date, um, and they're, they're not unlike the Euro-American ones, but the handmade ones, I think are the most explicit examples. Um, and they usually include, again, something white, you know, white, uh, you see a lot of shell, see a lot of reflective objects, glass and mirrors um, in those headstones. You read my mind, because I was just gonna ask a follow-up, what do we see in them, so thank you. Um, so we have three more. Um, Julia Bonestrong asks, what was your experience in working on this project? Oh, we already asked this one again. I'm so sorry. We have two more. Um, Dr. Brown, do you plan on expanding your research to a national level? Whoa, a national level? Um, I can say yes. I, I think yes. Uh, wait, I, I want to ask for clarity because National level meaning like I would go around to different sites or national level meaning I would expose this research to maybe a national audience. Cause that's, that's the line I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of like ex maybe a publication or you know, a book or you know, something like that. Um, and yeah, you know, something like that. But I love cemeteries from all over. And I forgot to mention this question is from Latoya Johnson. So if you do want to expand Latoya, we would be, that would be wonderful. Until there we go, wonderful. She says, yes, ma'am, going around to different sites and exposing others outside of Jacksonville. Thank you. Oh, 
So I, I am open to that. I think a lot goes into like establishing a research project. Like I don't want to just throw a dart at a map and just go <laughs> like whatever cemetery I find there. Like I want to, um, I think I would need to think a little bit more about where I would want to go with that, but I would have to stay in the South. I'm committed to the South as a region. Um, but yes, I would. I would, I would definitely uh, consider doing that. I enjoy uh, cemeteries, African-American cemeteries. They're my happy place, my peaceful place. Um, so yes. And I enjoy, I think the, uh, the record, the archeological record benefits from the, the more archeology span that you can get done in, the, in more places, you can use other sites like in Alabama. I have pictures from Alabama and South Carolina here. Um, you can use those to help fill holes in the gaps that, I'm, that you may have or I might have in other places like Florida or Georgia. Um, we're looking at sites that might've been around the same time. So I think it's important work and I'm definitely down to do it. And our last question is actually a comment is from Kay Mudar and they say institutions as agents of change that is so inspiring. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, we just got another question as I said, this is our <laughs> last one. Um, this is from anonymous, an anonymous attendee. They ask, were there issues the community wanted you to address or connect to such as racism or poverty, for example? If so, how did you address the contemporary community issues? Um, the next, such, so, um, addressing issues of poverty and, I'm sorry, could you, could you give that to me one more time? Yeah, the, let me, let me reread that. So they ask, were there issues the community wanted you to address or connect to such as racism or poverty, for example? If so, how did you address the contemporary community issues? Yeah, um, I, I did that through this, the cemetery. So um, the community that surrounds this cemetery is, this is a poorest, one of the poorest areas in the city. Um, and what the city was essentially arguing was it was their duty to, to care for the cemeteries, even though they're tax paying and the cemeteries are municipal. Um, so, and that's not the way that we see other plots um, Evergreen Cemetery and other spaces that are predominantly white or even Old City Cemetery, which is predominantly a black cemetery, but has a white uh, Euro-American patch in it of Confederate soldiers, which is adamantly cared for. It's the best looking part of the cemetery. So that was like question mark, right? Um, why is that the best looking part of the cemetery? Um, and we're kind of neglecting all of these spaces. And the community interpreted that as, as racism, right? Uh, the same types of neglect, uh, not picking up trash, uh, not uh, properly going into communities and uh, making sure like potholes are filled or allowing uh, dilapidated buildings to come to become public hazards and not trimming trees and things like that. Um, the same types of neglect the living community was experiencing in their environment, living, living the city of Jacksonville in some points of the city is actually dumping pollution in, in black, near black communities um, and had a settlement with black communities, that's an issue. So the same types of neglect that the living community was experiencing, uh, African-American residents were arguing that that same thing was happening to them in death via these cemeteries and the differences between uh, the way white cemeteries are maintained and the way that black cemeteries are maintained. Um, so I addressed it there. And I went through the history of how we got here, um, but also um, how much money and resources, right, makes a difference between how we allocate to one community and how we allocate, even though both communities are paying taxes. So both communities deserve the service. Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful questions, Dr. Brown, and for this wonderful and presentation. We are at 101. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you again, Dr. Brown, and have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming. Shout out to my sorority sisters. I see y'all. <laughs>